It's Friday! Yes, good Friday morning. <laughs> you know, uh, Tyler, I think back to Monday. <laughs> I, I, so when uh, Tyler came in Monday, he's like, is it Friday yet? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's only Monday, but it is Friday. It's a gloomy Friday out there, but there's always a silver lining in everything. And that means my grass is growing, my flowers are growing. And maybe it will help spur some hydrangea that all the oh. deer have been eating in my yard. Happy Friday, Tyler. Happy Friday, Ronnie. So welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith, where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we work to bring you the up and coming latest information with all the new make newsmakers throughout Oakland County and the state of Michigan regarding everything COVID-19 related because it is changing every single day. It's like almost six months into this and we're still debating issues that were in the beginning like masks. Do you wear them? What do they do? What do they not do? And that's one of the topics we are going to dive into today as well. So uh, just a reminder, you can watch and listen to us on uh, civiccentertv.com, which by the way, that makes us national does social media that's so you worldwide. don't have to just live here in oakland county and that's the good thing is that we're trying to bring you information not just here in oakland county while we try to focus on oakland county COVID 19 does cross borders into the other counties and and across the state lines so we try to bring you all the latest information uh related to this because it is changing every day you can also uh, watch us on birmingham area municipal access and listen to us on the uh radio 89.3 lakes fm 88.1 fm the beth and we want to say thank you to all of them for helping us get this message and all this information out as well and today every day we try to uh partner with someone within the community to be our Facebook partner of the day because it's such a big platform to try to get your message out. And today we uh, want to say a big thank you to Oakland University. They have thousands and thousands of followers on their Facebook page and they are streaming uh, today's Megacast live on Oakland University's Facebook page. So head over to there if you uh, are out and about. We all have Facebook on our page. Well, maybe everyone over the age of 20. Sure. <laughs> I don't. I, what is that age? Do you have Facebook? I do. Yeah. You do? Yeah. I think I think it's I think it's 18 and above. 18 and above. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the minimum age to create a, a page. I'm not sure. Well, no. I but younger kids don't use Facebook really. No, don't they don't. No. Anyone? No. no, no When's really the last Facebook. time you logged on to Facebook, Tyler? Uh, I only use, really use it for work here. That's pretty much it. <sighs> I feel old. <laughs> I I'm so sorry. feel old. <laughs> So, uh, real quickly, though, uh, let's go ahead and start off with some of the headlines. Uh, every day, like I said, things are changing. So, before we come in here to the Lakes FM Civic Center TV studio in West Bloomfield, uh, I we work to update the uh, headlines so that you don't have to scroll all the different news outlets. We do that for you and try to pick some of the big things that are uh, making news today. So, if you want to go ahead, you can find them. Uh, on civiccentertv.com, just click on coronavirus. It, this is going to be a big issue, I think, as we go into the next uh, few weeks, especially. Teacher Union is calling for more transparency in COVID-19 outbreaks at schools. Michigan's largest teachers union is demanding more transparency from districts about COVID-19 cases amid confusion, as well as frustration about state health laws that err on the side of privacy even amid a pandemic. Now, last week, of course, Michigan acknowledged that for at least 14 COVID-19 outbreaks at state schools and universities, but the state and local health officials, along with the governor, have resisted calls to release details. The Michigan Education Association, which represents about 120,000 educators in Michigan, pushing for transparency, saying safety trumps privacy. Yeah, this actually became an issue even early on and employers have been facing this as well. You have to understand that the HIPAA laws and the privacy of the individual, but at the same time, if you're trying to do contact tracing, how do you do that and then abide by those HIPAA laws as well? Yeah, you have to find a way to be able to track 
where these cases are going without violating the personal privacy of people and their, and their right to that privacy. So if there's a way that you can trace things back to certain people and warn them and, and pull them but without specific, without bringing too many specifics out there, sure, that's a way to do it. But it's a complicated situation that's not ever going to be that easy. And it still needs to be worked out for these teachers, between these teachers and their union, to, and between the medical community as well. I, I think we're going to see this uh, continue to play out uh, as this pandemic goes on. Like I said, uh, you know, employers have been dealing with this as, as well, especially when you're in a huge office building. You don't really know who's coming in contact with one another and who isn't. So we'll see where this goes as well. Uh, the rally at the state capitol to push for the return of high school sports. Those calling for high school sports competitions to resume this fall in Michigan will gather at the state capitol today for a rally. Hashtag let them play. It's a high school athletic support organization that plans to address the importance of high school sports to the youth of our community. Michigan High School Athletic Association announced this month that the fall football season will move to spring due to the sport's higher risk for spreading COVID-19. The rally is going to be held at the Capitol tonight from 4 to 7 for anyone out there who wants to join in. I don't think they're going to get much movement on this, Tyler. No. Uh, for, for one, the state government does not have any, necess any say in the MHSAA's decisions. Sure, certainly they have influence. But they don't have any say in that. So going to the state capitol to protest against the postponement of some fall sports and potential postponement of further fall sports, you're, you're going to the wrong place. And on top of that, I, I expect everyone at that rally to be wearing masks, to be keeping six feet apart, to understand that they're not COVID positive, to have maybe been tested. Because if you think it's safe enough to go out to these events, they have sports like football being played, you better be taking your own precautions yourself. Otherwise, don't be arguing that it's perfectly safe when you're bl if you're going to be blatantly not following those guidelines. So again, that uh, protest is happening in Lansing tonight at the Capitol building from 4 until 7 p.m. Also making news on CivicCenterTV.com, Oakland County is going to be providing free COVID-19 drive through testing for students. They announced that it's going to expand the free drive through testing to include kids ages 4 to 17. It's going to start on August 31st. Children must have symptoms to qualify. You also have to be a resident of Oakland County or attend a school in the county. Parents can begin scheduling testing appointments for their kids beginning Thursday through the Oakland County Health Division's Nurse on Call hotline. And we'll have that number for you on CivicCenterTV.com. No doctor's note or prescription is needed. And lastly, Michigan nears the coronavirus 100,000 mark. Nearly 100,000 cases of the new coronavirus have been reported in Michigan as of Thursday morning. That's according to the most recent data provided by state health officials. Michigan added 758 new coronavirus cases on Thursday, bringing the statewide virus total to 99,958. State also reported 16 more deaths being attributed to the coronavirus. The death toll now in the state of Michigan, 6,440. One thing we like to remind people when we talk about numbers, they're not just numbers on a piece of paper. These are people, they're uh, members of our community, they're our brothers and our sisters, and we have to remember that when we talk about these numbers. Yeah, these are not just milestones. These are, these are scary milestones, and we need to think about that we're only six months into this. We still don't have a vaccine. We're still several months away from a vaccine, and it's all the more incentive. That should be a reminder that we need to be following the guidelines that are in place, that we need to be taking the safety precautions that are being uh, that are being uh, said to us by the medical community because of those reasons. 100,000 people is not an insignificant number by any means. You know, the great thing about this, though, is the number of deaths is really declining from compared to where we were way back in, like, remember a April. April was really, really bad for the number of deaths in uh, yeah. This, the state of Michigan. So if we have any hope in all of this, it's it's taking a look at that. Yeah, and, and part of that has been because we, our state has done its part, our people, the people of Michigan have done their part to keep themselves safe. And uh, once we got out in front of this on the medical community side, we were able to take action 
from the side of civilians like you and I, and I, and I think that's definitely showing in the spread of the virus and definitely in the way that the, that, uh, the death rate has been in the state of Michigan. So, Tyler, as I said, it's Friday. Yes. We actually, um, we've had a great week, yeah. great week talking with a lot of uh, important people, a lot of information to share with people, and we're going to end the week uh, on another great note. Uh, a lot to get to today, but we want to go ahead and, if we can, start off with Kurt Lawson. He's the Deputy Police Chief Public Information Officer for the West Bloomfield Township Police Department. Kurt, it is always such a pleasure having you here on the Oakland County Megacast. Happy Friday to you. Well, happy Friday to you, Ronnie, and hello, Tyler. And uh, oh. I think Tyler said it yesterday. Boy, 2020 has been a lot of fun, hasn't it? <laughs> I just want to erase much. it from my memory, it's right? Too much fun. <laughs> and thank goodness it's Friday because I'm, I'm ready for it again. Hey, hey, Kurt, I know you're you're a father. Uh, schools are heading back to class. Uh, I know here in West Bloomfield this week and in other schools in the uh, in the coming weeks. Not sure how old your kids are if they're still in high school or college, but how are you handling this outside of the police department and your responsibilities over there? But just as a dad. Well, uh, so I have two daughters, 17 and 15, and every day is an adventure. And I got to tell you, if you're a person that doesn't like change or you're an anxious person, person, this 2020 is not for you. Uh, fortunately, I, I kind of can handle both. And uh, as a parent, that's that's kind of what you need. You have to be very flexible because there's so many changes and so many uncertainties out there on a daily basis uh, with education and the fact that you have to wear masks and uh, uh, capacity limits at different stores and restaurants. There's just so much going on this year. Uh, but you know, my heart goes out to the parents, to the educators, to the administrators, because uh, it's been a heavy lift for, for everybody. So we'll go ahead and uh, kind of dive in from a police department standpoint with the kids heading back into the classroom. How's that for your department? And uh, what are you guys doing? I know there's a lot of extra patrols out on the street. I've been seeing you as coming as uh, I've been coming into the office. We're just down the street from you. Right, so uh, every year uh, we increase patrols uh, at all the schools. Uh, we have our school liaison officer that goes into each school. Um, so we encourage our officers on a daily basis to stop into the school, obviously wearing their, their personal protection equipment to go in and say hi to everyone, let the administrators, the teachers, the students know that, that we're there. And we're gonna remain visible uh, throughout the community, but specifically at our schools. Kurt, one of the hard things this year as a driver and someone who is a regular citizen, maybe you don't have kids in the school district, you don't understand the changes within West Bloomfield, they have different times this year. So we're used to, hey, there's going to be increased traffic like it, you know, uh, in the morning and the afternoon for pickup, but that's different this year. Well, the schedule has been uh, fluid to say the least and every school district has been a little bit different. Uh, but West Bloomfield, you know, they have the, if you're not in the high school, uh, you're going to school uh, certain days of the week and the times are all different. So we have just uh, sent out an email to all of our officers to make sure they fully understand uh, the school district schedule. And we also understand that that may change depending on uh, infection rates. And uh, as you know, as we move through this pandemic, uh, things can change very quickly. Kurt, in terms of managing traffic, as we have multiple times that the kids are uh, arriving to school and dismiss and being dismissed from school. We spoke to Chief John Fitzgerald in Kegel Harvard yesterday about the work that his department's doing at Roosevelt Elementary and assisting at Abbott, uh, at Abbott Middle School. What kind of similar work is being done in West Bloomfield at our elementary school, our K through eight institutions in West Bloomfield, who are having in-person learning uh, four days a week? So, like I said, we're just being visible. Uh, certainly, if a school identifies that they're having a traffic problem outside of the school or they need some assistance. Uh, getting the parents out uh, as far as vehicular traffic, uh, we'll be more than glad to assist them. Uh, we staff pretty heavy on the road uh, with our patrol officers, so we're always there and willing to help. So Kurt, of course we have to um, touch on what's going on in Wisconsin. I know Governor mm -hmm. Whitmer just announced that she is going to be sending members of the Michigan National Guard to Wisconsin to assist with the civil unrest that is going on there. This has to be a hard time to be a police officer trying to defend your your profession when these incidents happen. 
what is that like and when you see videos such as these come out what what goes through your mind in those moments well it's been a tough year uh to be in law enforcement and uh you know it, my concern is as we go from one incident it seems like to another incident is how are we going to survive as a profession how are we going to recruit the people that we need to recruit and what our nation expects. Uh, we really need to uh, recruit more minorities into law enforcement. How do we do that with uh, what we're seeing day to day? Uh, one of the problems that I see with the latest incident uh, with Jacob Blake and Kenosha PD is, and you know this is a PIO, it's so important as a law enforcement agency to control that narrative, to be transparent, to let the public know exactly what you know, what the facts are, as you know, at that point, and we went three days where I heard nothing uh, from from them, and I think they allowed other people to control that narrative. So that, to me, it was a problem, uh, and I, I'm going to reserve judgment uh, as far as that incident itself. Only only information I have is from that video, uh, so I don't I don't know anything besides that. But I wish they would have got out in front of that a little bit more, and uh, we've seen that time and time again from Chief Craig in Detroit, where. And he's gone out and he's released videos. And uh, you know what? We're, we're human beings in law enforcement. And from time to time, we are going to make mistakes. And when you make a mistake, you've got to own it. And uh, that's what we've always done here at West Bloomfield. Thankfully, we don't make very many mistakes. But when we do, we own it. We let people know that, hey, we had to make a split second decision in this circumstance. And in this particular circumstance, we made a mistake. Uh, and, and we're going to learn by it. So that's the way we've been. And I'll say maybe more on a macro level that, you know, many black Americans throughout this country uh, say that they see inequality in the way that they're treated by law enforcement and uh, law enforcement needs to recognize this uh, and they need to figure out what we need to bridge this gap. You know, we start with communication. We start with listening. Uh, we have a good dialogue and we figure out how we can build this 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 relationship back where it needs to be. Yeah, I think we're seeing that right now in pro sports, where some of the football players, the Lions, even Matthew Stafford came out and said being able to listen to his teammates helped him understand things more. And I think in law enforcement that is needed. So as uh, Kurt had mentioned, I was a public information officer for ATF. And the feds right now are getting such a backlash for coming into Detroit to help with the violent crime. And you want to try to say is like, the feds have been here forever. Uh, they just brought in additional resources. What's so hard about this, Kurt, is when politics get involved in law enforcement, how do you navigate that? Because I will say as someone who was a journalist who got into law enforcement, I was surprised at the level of politics involved in keeping our streets and our neighborhoods safe because I don't think the criminals go through the politics that we go through. Well, how I navigate it is I'm very careful. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but you know what it is in law enforcement? You just got to do the right thing. And that's one thing Chief Patton from day one that he became chief here is he always tells everyone, do the right thing. And that's the way we operate. And uh, we, we, we set politics aside. And, uh, you know, our politicians right here in West Bloomfield, uh, they're all Democrats. Um, and, and I think Democrats have gotten somewhat of a bad rap as far as whether they support or don't support law enforcement. But our township board has been extremely supportive of law enforcement here in West Bloomfield. Uh, they have given us the tools that we need uh, to be successful, and, and we're greatly appreciative of that. Uh, one of the th uh, good things about West Bloomfield, it's a very diverse community, which from a policing standpoint can also make it a bit of a difficult and bit of a challenge. Can you talk a little bit about how your department has reached out to the community to try to bridge those gaps and also humanizing the badge and how important is social media and getting that message out? There's a lot of questions there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One of the things that Chief and I say, and it's, it's kind of a funny thing that we say, is that we're in bed with everyone here in West Bloomfield. Uh, we are in the Chaldean community, we're in the Jewish community, we're in the African American community. We belong to every nonprofit group that's out there. We have someone on, on the board of, of all the nonprofits. Uh, we're at the clergy, all of that. So we, we reach out and we look at ourselves as partners with our community. 
Uh, we're not some occupying force here in West Bloomfield. We are partners with our community and we're problem solvers to try to better our community that we all love. And yes, this is one of the most diverse communities in the state of Michigan. And I think that we're doing a lot of things right here and we really could be the blueprint for law enforcement agencies across the state and how they develop these partnerships with their community and how we engage in community policing. And it's not just Chief Patton and, and Kurt Lawson that are the face of the department. Uh, we really encourage our officers to go out and talk to people uh, to introduce themselves and to kind of humanize that badge. And then the third, third component of all of that, and, and you discussed is the importance of social media. And uh, we really, I think do we do a pretty decent job in, in marketing our department and marketing our team and, and how they are committed to this community. And, and we've been very successful with it. Hey, Kurt, is the West Bloomfield Police Department on TikTok? Uh, we have done some TikTok videos uh, not necessarily in the last couple of months, but at the beginning of 2020, we did some TikTok videos and uh, uh, we got that encouragement from my youngest daughter that said, uh, get with it. Because uh, like you said, uh, we, we really love Facebook and uh, we've moved into Instagram and Twitter, but TikTok is huge and it's something that we're definitely going to be continue to use in the, in the future. Kurt, you've mentioned... There you go, there's my mic. Kurt, you've mentioned that um, continuing the conversations with communities of marginalized people uh, in West Bloomfield that, that you are uh, covering in your department has been crucial. It's been something that your department's been focusing on over the last several months as we've seen these incidents with departments all throughout the country. How, is, how are you and, and Chief Patton and your team continuing those conversations uh, in between these incidents and keeping those conversations going even when they're not necessarily on the forefront nationally? So we get asked questions all the time from um, leaders within the African-American community. I just had a conversation two nights ago uh, with the uh, president of AT&T, uh, the state of Michigan, and he wanted to know uh, my thoughts on police reform and, and how AT&T could help. And we had a great conversation. Um, so yeah, we're always engaging in these conversations. We're letting them know what we're doing, uh, our views on what needs to be done nationally. Uh, we really believe, and I think the chief would agree with this, that it starts with leadership. And we got to make sure that we have the progressive leaders in law enforcement, educated leaders, leaders that understand what needs to be done in police reform. Uh, the second part of that is we need funding. We need, to, we need to have funding for law enforcement agencies to provide the proper equipment and the proper training for their people. And uh, I think that, you know, what you see in West Bloomfield, it, it's very special. We have the money, uh, we have the training, our officers, I, I consider our officers some of the best officers in the state of Michigan, uh, but there's smaller departments that, that they wanna be that, they wanna have that quality, but they don't have the money for the training. So, so we need to make sure that the funds are available for the training, for the equipment, and to be able to recruit the very best people. Uh, so. There's a lot of work to be done in law enforcement. I think we've been working on it uh, nationally, but not to the pace that has satisfied our minority communities. So we need to step up the pace, but uh, that involves funding. We do need funding, not defunding the police. Kurt Lawson, he is the Deputy Police Chief Public Information Officer over at West Bloomfield Township. And as you said, it you can't defund the police and not have the training that they need. I think a lot of this comes with training and it also comes with, we need to diversify the ranks and that is bridging the gaps. But one thing that you mentioned was uh, kind of the difference in, in the minority groups. And I think one of the hard things with Jacob Blake and what happened in Wisconsin was seeing the difference of, again, and I try to you reserve judgment on everything that happened because you know coming from law enforcement that what you're seeing in that 20 second video clip is not the entire story. So you need to you know have the facts and the figures to be able to make an informed decision. However, in today's day and age where videos are out there in a split second, you had the incident with Jacob Blake, with him being shot uh, by the police officer, but then you have the incident with the 17 year old Kyle Rittenhouse and the video of him, you know, uh, being accused of shooting the people and then walking as putting, he had an, you know, the rifle on him, his hands are in the air 
and people are screaming he just shot someone and the police continue to drive by. I know it's different situations in different moments, but that kind of feeds into this narrative that police are racially profiling. How do you explain that to your community? Because I'm sure you're getting the questions that are being asked all over the country. Sure. I don't know enough about that incident that you just spoke about to really comment it comment on it, so I'm, I'm not going to comment on it, but I will say that I'll tell you one of the things that we do when we first hire someone here at West Bloomfield. Their first 10 minutes in the door, they're sitting down with me and we're having a conversation, and I'm telling them as uh, an executive here within the West Bloomfield Police Department, I'm going to provide you the best training, the best equipment possible. I'm going to have your back. Uh, we're going to make you a successful police officer, but if we find out that you're racial profiling, that if you're using excessive force, if, the, if you're racially biased, that uh, the chief and I are gonna do everything possible to remove you from our agency. So that is very clear, very quickly. Uh, and that's a message that I, I put out to the, the new recruits and uh, Chief Patton does the exact same thing. So Kirk, can you talk a little bit about when you're talking about the training and also the discipline? I know there's a big push to come up with a national database of police officers that have been disciplined. People feel that the unions protect a lot of these officers. They're allowed to retire and just move from department to department. What are your thoughts on that? So there is a uh, national use of force database. It was established in early 2019 and uh, the West Bloomfield Police Department, we jumped on that right away and uh, provided uh, data to them, which was basically zero. And uh, the data that they collect was, uh, you know, if a fatality occurs, uh, in connection with the use of force uh, from a police agency, or if there's serious injury in connection with the use of force, or even if a firearm was just discharged at or near an individual. So uh, we believe that you know data is extremely important uh, within the West Bloomfield Police Department, and we have participated with that use of force uh, data program from day one. Kurt Lawson with us on the Oakland County Megacast. He is the Deputy Police Chief and Public Information Officer with West Bloomfield Township. Kurt, just a few more minutes with you before we let you go. Is there anything else that you'd like to discuss today that we haven't talked about or anything else that uh, you believe is important for our community to know? Well, absolutely. I want to throw some kudos out to our officers and detectives. We've had some major incidents here in the past several weeks, uh, and I'll just briefly we had uh, two individuals that allegedly came in from uh, a different jurisdiction, uh, a different city. They came into the township one evening and they, uh, they entered two residences that were found to be unlocked. And the homeowners were actually home asleep during the time. Uh, they, they went through the house, they stole some items. Uh, they went to the neighborhood. They were entering unlocked vehicles, stole a bunch of items. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our detectives were able to uh, catch up with one of them about a day later, and he is safely in custody. So we just want to remind all of our residents, even though this is one of the safest communities in Michigan, that incidents like these can happen here. And we just encourage them to keep their doors locked, especially at night. Uh, keep your cars locked. If you have valuables within your car, keep them out of sight. Uh, you know, help us help you. And then the second incident we had was we had a uh, young lady uh, that alleges that a, a young man tried to rob her at a local ATM at a bank. And uh, we have that individual in custody as well. So a great job by our, our detectives and our officers here at West Bloomfield in the last week and a half. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of major incidents, but uh, they've safely brought these two individuals into custody. Crimes of opportunity. Lock your house, lock your cars. My husband is constantly on me to lock the house i forget hey uh kurt before i let you go i'm on tiktok what are you what's your name on what's the department well, i'm not name? personally on it no, i can the, tell you my <laughs> what's the what you the west bloomfield police department i'm trying to find you guys i think well, i want to see a tiktok video from you all right i will find out i don't know off the top of my head because like i said we haven't been on there in a little while but uh i'll get that information to you and you can let people know get grooving we want to see uh, the west bloomfield police department on tiktok we're going to be on there, I promise. <laughs> Kurt Lawson, he is the Deputy Police Chief Public Information Officer for the West Bloomfield Township Police Department. You know, Tyler, they do an amazing job over there. 
uh, at West Bloomfield. A great, great effort by all of them and their team members to try to reach out to our community. Yeah, they do, they do a great job of keeping the, communica- the lines of communication open with the community. If there's an incident, whether it's in the township or outside of the township, they're always right there on the forefront to discuss those issues and be open about it. They're not afraid. They're not going to, they're not afraid to be open about those issues. They're not uncomfortable to talk about the uncomfortable conversation. And that's exactly what you're hoping for from police department, especially in these times in terms of communicating with the local community. We definitely need that now more than ever. Transparency is going to be key to be able to continue to bridge the gap between our law enforcement departments and the community. Hey, uh, we're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we come back, we are heading to Oakland University, which, by the way, they are a Facebook partner of the day. So you can also watch us live streaming on their page. We want to say thank you to them for doing so. And we're going to be talking about some of the students that are trying to navigate COVID-19. And it's a very stressful time for them financially as well. And talking about how people are helping them and how you can help some of these uh, colleges and the students uh, through a time of giving. I know it's hard for a lot of people, but it's needed right now. You're listening to and watching the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 mask. The ball's in your court, Michigan. Welcome back to the Oakland County Mega Cast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. And you are listening and watching us. Uh, the Oakland County Mega Cast, CivicCenterTV.com. We appreciate all of those with the Cable Commission for allowing us to help bring you the information as we continue to navigate uh, COVID-19. I'm sure that when you guys started this back on what was it, March, Tyler, that yep. you didn't anticipate it being going on for this long. Nope. Nope, did not. Did not anticipate that. That's for sure. Well, I think uh, a lot of people don't understand the amount of work and effort that it takes to bring them this, but we are happy to do so because there are yes, so are. many important issues that need to be covered and they are changing each and every day. And, you know, we want to go ahead and talk. Uh, college students are returning to campus right now, and I found there was a recent report from the Hope Center for College Community and uh, Justice at Temple University. Nearly three in five students experienced some kind of basic needs insecurity during the pandemic. According to this report, 44% of students at two-year colleges and 38% of students at four-year institutions reported food insecurity, while 36% and 41% reported housing insecurity and 15% of our college students are experiencing homelessness. And that's uh, important things that we wanna talk about because we need to reach out to these students. So let's go ahead and bring in Mike Westfall. He's the Vice President of University Advancement over at Oakland University. Mike, thank you so much for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Oh, thank you for having me. This is great. Tell us a little bit about the uh, your program and what it does. And, and we know the need is great, but what does that money go towards? 
Yeah, so in normal times, so pre-pandemic, we spend a lot of uh, effort engaging our various constituents, uh, you know, alumni, friends of the community, corporations and foundations to uh, generate uh, financial support for our students and our programs. And uh, in universities around the country, this is this is what uh, what we do to try to make up the difference between um, what state funding provides and tuition dollars. Um, over the last you know 20 years, there's been a disinvestment in higher education around the country, and Michigan's no different. Um, only 80 percent of uh, of our budget, or over 80 percent of our budget, comes from tuition dollars. Only 20 percent from the state. 20 years ago, those numbers were reversed. And so uh, fundraising for us really helps make a, 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 a good experience, an excellent experience for our students and our various programs in the community. It's, you know, I, a few years ago, just a couple years ago, I was looking at taking a couple classes and I couldn't believe from the time I went to college how much tuition is raised from then to now and making it so inaccessible so these students are doing what they can they're taking out loans but at the end of the day too those sometimes they're still going hungry and they're still needing a place to stay how do you support those students and what it's important to keep them in the classrooms because they're going to help all of us in uh, the society later on down the road if we can get them through the process Absolutely. What, you, what you've seen around the country, and I think that Oakland University, I've been with the university just for just over two years, and, and we do an excellent job of, of providing student services. Uh, we have an outstanding uh, uh, you know, support team um, in student affairs that focuses on that. And so again, pre-pandemic, we have all these support services um, and programs already set up. Once the pandemic hit, we really stepped up and, and from a fundraising standpoint, we tailored our message to really focus on immediate emergency needs because um, when the economy um, you know, sputtered to a stop, um, a lot of uh, you know, the majority of part-time employees um, weren't able to work. And students, when, they get, when they're working their way through school, which the overwhelming majority of our students um, also work while they're going to school, um, it really negatively impacted them. And so um, our you know, university leadership with Dr. Orhurst Peskovitz, um, her and Glenn uh, McIntosh, who oversee VP for Student Affairs and our Chief Diversity Officer, it was very important to them that we created a safety net, if you will. And so um, at the inception of the pandemic, uh, we started various uh, fundraising efforts and generated over $200,000 in support of our students that were in need with the majority of the funding going to our COVID-19 student relief fund. And it went to help with things like that you mentioned, food insecurity, um, utility bills. There were so many issues that popped up as a direct impact of, of, the, of the virus. Mike Westfall with us, Vice President of the University Advancement at Oakland University. Mike, uh, with all this money that has come in from the fundraising during the pandemic, how many students, or about how many students, has that helped to keep not only learning at Oakland University, but keep them living with the basic necessities during this tough time? It's helped you know, hundreds of students. Um, well over 300 students have benefited from this. And then also um, the federal government, uh, we, uh, we participated in, in the CARES Act um, um, and, and half, those, half those monies went to help uh, with uh, towards $500 um, you know, awards uh, to, to, uh, to, our, our, to, to the majority of our students. Mike, I know a lot of uh, organizations and, and nonprofits, they're having such a hard time with fundraising right now because businesses are cutting back, uh, people, individuals are cutting back on what they're donating. Are you at Oakland University feeling that impact as well? We, we we are but in in different sectors and so as a good example is that we've we've seen you know uh, a dramatic increase in support from uh, the regional foundations uh, you know we're fortunate that in Michigan and particularly in within Oakland County and in our proximity to Detroit that there are a multitude of foundations that have really stepped up and so we're grateful for for their their their, their leadership and their ability to support um, corporations um, you know they've they've uh, pulled back a little bit 
bit, understandably so, because they're going through their own financial challenges. And I have to admit, I've been, um, you know, pleasantly surprised at the generosity um, of, of our alumni and our friends. Um, a great example of that um, is, you know, we've had over, um, I got the, you know, over 600 donors um, just to our COVID relief funds, um, totaling over $200,000. And then when you look at our faculty and staff, our faculty and staff really embrace the student population and the core mission of the university. Um, I have, I've been at a number of universities and consulted at a number of universities I've never seen as much engagement from faculty and staff as I have here. Uh, you know, every year our faculty and staff contribute over half a million dollars um, to various scholarships and programs throughout the university. And we have, you know, record participation. Uh, last year alone, we had um, over, over 1,600 donors, um, you know, to the all university fund drive. And so we're fortunate, we're blessed that we're in a very, you um, uh, caring place as Oakland University, but I also believe that the region has done a lot in terms of stepping up and, and helping those in need. Um, you know, and one of the things that that uh, we pride ourselves on that I'm very proud of of Oakland University is that during this time, it really wasn't just about helping our students. It was also about helping the community as well. And so we were able to do two major initiatives and of, of many, but our two major initiatives were that uh, we turned our Oakland Center, which is basically the student union um, and it was a beautiful building, but we turned that into a food pantry for the community and partnering with uh, local um, organizations, we were able to actively um, you know, hand out uh, food during the worst uh, period of the pandemic. Also, we ended up, um, you know, through uh, Dr. Peskovitz, um, we were able to offer up um, some of our residence halls for the region's uh, healthcare professionals. And so we were able to secure funding again from the community and area foundations to support the housing of folks during the, uh, to, during the worst of the pandemic, because we were able to house uh, um, healthcare workers that uh, did not want to necessarily go home um, in the evening and potentially um, uh, you know, pass on the virus to their family if they had it. And also uh, some healthcare workers were brought in to help with the, with the early surge. And so uh, Oakland University is really about, uh, has been about our students always, but also about the community as well. So many different areas to think about and so many different areas that needed uh, need that needed help during this time. How do you prioritize who gets what and who you can help and who you can't? Yeah, I think that we basically I, we've we've been able to help everybody that, that that came to us, and if we weren't able to, we were able to point them in other directions. And so it was a never a no with a you know a slam door in their face. It was just like you know um, you know because we did run we have run out of some some funds, but we were able to direct to some some other areas and some uh, other sources that they may be able to get assistance. Mike Westfall with us, Vice President of University Advancement at Oakland University, our Facebook partner on today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We thank the university for joining us on this OU Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. And Mike, uh, in terms of trends that you've seen over the course of the pandemic, how has giving in our community, specifically in the Oakland University community as it relates to your fundraising, changed? Well, I think, and it's it's no different from you know even us doing it this this way through Zoom. Uh, everything's become much more virtual, and that's going to be a challenge for fundraising in general for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, you know when when you talk about uh, philanthropy, it is really about relationships. Um, you know, people, you know, seem to view what we do as we get labeled as fundraisers, which which I get. Um, you know, because that's ultimately, you know, our ultimate goal. But, but my goal is, is, is about relationships. If I have a good relationship or if my team has good relationship with folks, money's a byproduct of that, of course. But so is advocacy, awareness, and, and participation. And so um, in relationships, as we know, it's face-to-face. It's 
And so right now, having to do everything via the Internet and, and via the computer and, and screens, um, it makes it a little bit more difficult. But what we've been doing is that uh, we've been reaching out more, um, you know, my team, rather than just relying on the face to face. Um, you know, the, one of the first things that uh, my team did, uh, because we have so many just wonderful people that, that support this great institution, is that, uh, you know, we called everybody. Um, and just said, hey, how you're doing? And, and just tried to, you know, check in. Do they need anything? Um, was there anything that we could do to help folks? Because ultimately, that's, that's what it's about. It's about the relationship. Um, if someone makes a contribution as a result of that relationship, that, that, that's great. Um, but really, um, you know, just like we care so greatly about our students, we care a great deal about uh, the folks that support this university, our alumni, our friends in, in the community. So it's just switching to the virtual environment um, and understanding and appreciating that folks are going through some financial hardships right now. And so we are not uh, going out of our way to ask as much as we normally would. Um, it, it's really just about, about listening and being there for folks. And then keeping people abreast about um, what's going on at the university. How are we responding to the pandemic? Um, how are our students, what kind of experience are they gonna have in, in, in the fall? And then, and then those conversations many times lead to, what can I do to help? And, and once, you know, once we get that question, then we can point them to um, a number of our, our COVID impact funds. So for example, in the beginning, we really focus on the immediate impacts, but right now we're starting to transition more towards focusing on scholarship support for the fall and then even into next spring, because you know, you know, enrollment for folks is, you know, is going to be a challenge because of financial pressures. And so we're really switching our focus to, you know, from helping with the light bill or rent or food insecurities um, to, to really focusing on the long term of, of keeping folks engaged in their college, you know, in their university and educational journey. And, and that, that's going to be a major priority going forward. And, and we're starting to see some folks really step up and help with that scholarship support so folks don't have to take a break. Because as we all know, we all have friends that decided that they were going to sit out for a semester or sit out for a year and that semester or that year turns into five years ten years and they never complete their degree and we are about degree you know completion here at oakland yeah we see that all too often mike westfall vice president of university advancement at oakland university and you know mike you you talked a little bit about relationships and the importance of relationships so for the students who are out there struggling or you have a business that wants to help or an individual that wants to help and maybe they have expertise in their field, if they can't give money, is there a way to mentor students as well to try to support them in that arena? Yeah, there is. Um, you know, you, w one of the things that we've seen a lot from various, you know, from folks is that you know they they might they might not be able to have assets, but they, they can you know contact us if if they have you know pos potential positions through our you know career you know, through career services, um, internships, uh, part time work. Um, so again, a, a part of that uh, an umbrella of support uh, that we have within student affairs. Um, you know, we do a great job of placing people in jobs and so if there are potential employers in there that would like a good you know college student to either part-time or internship that's always welcome um, we've had some folks step up uh, right now we're in conversations with a uh, with a, a major uh, company automobile automobile company that wants to give us PPE um, and uh, you know personal protection equipment and and so we we take a lot in terms of gift gift in kind um, we've had you know folks donate masks um, and, and different materials. And so there's always you know, an avenue that if someone wants to get involved, we can try to find that find that fit. And, and I will do, I'd like to do just a little bit of an infomercial because I, I've experienced this firsthand and, and it goes back to the internship piece. I was amazed in my first year here, um, seeing the, the support that we get from the corporate community in terms of, of, of how many internships are available to our students. Over 90% of our students are from Michigan and over 90% of our students stay in Michigan. So an investment in Oakland University and in our students is really an investment in the local economy. Well, when we moved here from the state of Washington, 
my son transferred from the University of Washington and uh, he secured an internship uh, with Borg Warner. And uh, in, in two months prior to graduation, which was just this this summer, um, he was offered a full time job and he would not have gotten that without that internship and without the great relationships that uh, our career services team has with the corporate community. So, um, again, you know, th there are challenges out there for our students. And the key thing to remember is that we may not have all the answers, but we care and we will help find the answers and do everything that we can to support our students. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a multitude of things that, that, that we can do and that we're willing to do. Mike Westfall with us uh, from Oakland University. And again, we thank you for being our Facebook partner of the day. You talked a little bit about relationships and, and the internships. And I know coming from broadcast, your internships are pretty much everything one of the uh, things that can make a, an internship hard though is when they're non-paid internships how do you suggest students balance the two arenas and still make it through their courses because time management is a big thing when you are a college student yeah well i think you know everything's a test and and i you know i view everything as is a challenge um, you know, when I look at uh, in my personal case, you know, the, you know, it was a paid internship for, for my son and, and, and mo in the majority of them from what I've seen and heard um, are, are paid. But for those that are unpaid, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's a very difficult to, to, to balance. But I also find that, uh, that, you know, students figure it out. And, and one of the things that we're teaching through the education process and Oakland's, you know, no different in this way is that you're teaching resilience because if you're able to figure it out and grind and, and take advantage of the support services that, that we have on campus. And so let's say that you are having, um, you know, challenges balancing. We have, we have extensive counseling services on, on campus. Um, our advisors can help, you know, manage, uh, you know, you know um, and, and, and work with students about, you know, different techniques that they can use to prioritize or, or, or manage, you know, what, what they have on their plate. Um, the, the key thing is, is not necessarily just having solutions, but having that support network, which we which we have in, in spades here at Oakland. So uh, real quick, uh, just out of curiosity, when it comes to your fundraising, how much comes from like individuals and small ver small businesses versus larger corporations? Yeah, the majority of our fundraising uh, is, is is from individuals um, and, uh, and and alumni. Um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, we have a relatively young alumni base, uh, given that we were founded in 1957, um, and so we uh, we have over well over 100,000 alumni. But uh, but they're, the average age is is a lot less than 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 most of our peers. Um, you know, the corporate community has been very success, you know, been very, very generous, uh, but, the, but they have, you know, limitations as well. So, you know, I, over 70% of our fundraising comes from individuals. And right now we're in the midst of a, of a comprehensive campaign. Um, it's uh, our largest campaign ever. Um, it's a $150 million campaign that was launched in uh, November of 2018. Uh, we are fortunate to have Malcolm Gladwell here on campus um, to assist with that, with that campaign. Uh, launch and celebration. Uh, but uh, right now we're about $77 million towards that goal. And so we're right on track. Um, and our, our fundraising is, uh, you know, remarkably, you know, we're seeing record results over, over these last uh, several years. Uh, this year, you know, I'm a little bit concerned it's going to be a little bit more difficult, but I'm confident and, and I'm, you know, optimistic that, uh, that folks will continue to, uh, to, to step up. You know, Mike, I think a lot of people, when they think about giving money, especially to a university, they feel like it has to be a lot of money. I would imagine even in these days, if it's $5, $10, $15, give up your Starbucks and help a student. Yeah, um, you know, you know, what's funny is that a lot of organizations focus on, you know, how much um, which can be important, you know, in, in some cases, but, you know, we focus on on how many. Um, every relationship's different. 
Um, every, everybody has different capacity uh, levels um, or, or different desired goals that they're trying to achieve. And our role really is just to be a conduit to help them achieve their philanthropic goals. Um, you know, no dollar is, is too small and conversely, no dollar is too big. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it, it really is up to that individual. And so we're here to help them and, and, uh, and, and help them fulfill uh, what their ultimate goals are. And so um, annual gifts um, are, are very important. Um, and, and we get a lot of gifts, you know, for scholarship support. Um, the larger gifts uh, tend to be towards um, specific initiatives, but everything is over 99% of our gifts are restricted to an intended purpose. Um, we do not get a lot of discretionary uh, giving um, because folks want to know exactly where their money is going. Um, they want to make sure that's having the desired impact that they want. And it's, and it's our role to facilitate that and make sure that, the, that, uh, that their investment is going exactly where they want it to go and that it's being utilized in the way that they want it utilized. I know as you stated, uh, or as is stated on the website, an education for students today means a stronger tomorrow for the entire community. If someone wants to donate, how can they do that? Well, you know, we, we have a, you know, obviously go to the website, uh, you know, first off, but, uh, you know, we have a ton of information there. There, there are ability, there's the ability to make an online gift to a multitude of des designations. Um, but, but I always prefer the, the face to face as much as possible, or at least voice to voice. And so if, if people are interested in, in giving at all, helping with any of our COVID, uh, impact efforts, uh, particularly that of scholarships, because again, I think that's going to be absolutely critical, not only for our university, but for all universities. And so if anybody's listening to this, um, they may not have any affinity or connection to Oakland university. They may have their own home university. That's fine. Give, give there. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're happy to um, to to accept you know any philanthropic support for our students, but but you know, philanthropy is about how people feel, and and where their feelings lie, or with with the institution, or also just supporting the community that that they, they live within. Um, the majority of our individual donors uh, are, uh, you know, surprisingly in some cases are non alumni. That's, that makes up the majority of our donor base um, because I think that folks recognize the, the impact that Oakland University has um, you know, in Oakland County, but also within Southwest uh, Michigan and in, in the region. And so, um, so you know, whether folks give to Oakland University, that's great, but, but just give and, and, and support those students. But if people are interested in supporting Oakland, they're more than happy to reach out to me and uh, I will connect them, you know, with a member of my team or facilitate it myself. It, it just, we're just grateful for the support and the consideration. And we're grateful for your time this morning. Thank you so much for being with us in the Oakland County Megacast. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, go Grizzlies. Well, thank you so much. This is a great service you folks provide to the community and it's very much appreciated. We appreciate that. You have a happy weekend. Uh, so, you know, Tyler, there are a lot of different ways that a person can give. In fact, uh, sometimes to a, a reminder to students to reach out, let people know that you need help. We had someone on our neighborhood uh, Facebook page, or I think it was Sylvan Lakes page or, or Keiko Harbor. She's a nursing student at Oakland University, and she was asking people for their can and bottle donations so that she could buy her, her textbooks. So, there are a lot of ways that you can get help, and I can tell you she's been busy picking up cans from throughout the neighborhood. Normally, we throw ours in the recycling bin, but when I saw that, we started collecting, and, uh, you know, if she's willing to come get them, put them in there, but there are different ways to support, so even if you are struggling right now, you don't feel like you have money, reach out to these students and support them. Yeah. Yeah, our, our college students are always in a position where they're struggling uh, in, our, in our country at this point in, in our history with the tuition prices, with student loan situations being what they are. And it's even more so now in the pandemic where jobs are, more so, are tougher to come by. Some of them have lost their jobs and they're not able to pull un unemployment. Some do not have jobs and aren't able to find them. So it's an even tougher con tougher situation for these students now more than ever so your support of the students more so than the university or even 
or even the university and the students is all more supported in these times than ever. Yeah. You know, hey, I have uh, two nieces that are nurses and, the, yeah. you know, this student one day she may save my life. So that's why we give to other people, because you never know. It, they support the community where we all live and we are better when we work together. So Oakland University, thank you so much again for being our Facebook partner of the day as well. Head over to Oakland University's website. There's a lot of information there. If you do want to give, please know though that you don't have to be a multimillionaire to give. They're looking for donations to support their students in any way that they can. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keefe. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, the all-important discussion six months into this that we're all talking about still mask should you wear them how should you wear them do they work we are going to clear up the confusion here on the oakland county megacast i am dr faust the medical director for the oakland county health division the most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands step one turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water step two Apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I have to push the right buttons there. Uh, Tyler, how are you? Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. It's Friday. Yes, it is. Oh, joyous. <laughs> I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. You are listening to us on 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills, and watching us on Civic Center TV and the Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Also, if you are on cable, you can catch us uh, on Channel 15 on Comcast and Channel 99 on AT&T, which basically means, Tyler, we're everywhere. We are. You can catch over. us everywhere. I think social media is a good thing as well. Uh, so as a, as a lot of people know, I'm still trying to learn the board. So Tyler is always reaching over trying to correct all my mistakes. So thank you for everyone that is tuning in with us. And thank you to Tyler as always oh, for uh, helping me out here. Hey, uh, so this has been a really big issue if, from the beginning, of, from the start reason. of this pandemic. So we want to talk about masks because remember back in the beginning, they were saying you don't need a mask. And I think the concern was there, the issue of people running or our healthcare workers running out of the all important N95 mask. And then the CDC came out and said, no, we need to wear a mask. And now it is a mandate here in the state of Michigan. But there are so many questions and concerns and, and discussions around the mask. So to help us clarify everything on this all important topic, 
We are joined now by Dr. Jennifer Burgess. She is with the Family Medicine Physician with Henry Ford Health System. Thank you so much for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast and taking time out of your Friday to be with us. Thank you for having me. Why is this so confusing for people? Well, as you said, the guidelines have been changing ever since March, and that makes things extremely confusing for everybody. So you, you're spot on. Back in March, we were really con concerned about resources for all of us in healthcare, including even the surgical masks. So uh, to help us conserve, the recommendation was to not wear a mask as, as we kind of caught up on all of our resources. Uh, evidence and, and guidelines and science showed that wearing a mask is helpful and even a cloth mask is better than nothing. So what we're seeing right now is science and, and evidence in real time and every day things are changing, which is extremely confusing for even us in healthcare. So where we stand today, do you recommend wearing a mask, but not only wearing a mask, what type of mask should people be wearing? So the current recommendation is for anybody two, two years old or above to wear a mask if that is possible. Um, a, a cloth mask is going to be helpful in preventing transmission. It's not perfect, uh, but it will help keep particles from uh, uh, affecting other people. A surgical mask is also going to be very helpful. N95s are still slightly short-handed, so if possible to conserve those, it would be better to save those for the healthcare professionals, but if you have one, that, that will also be useful. The uh, valve masks, unfortunately, are not beneficial as there's a release uh, on the mask that will allow particles to go through, and therefore it defeats the purpose of protecting other people. Well, you know, I just saw an article, too. I think it was some of the casinos, uh, the tribal casinos were saying that you if you, you need a mask, but they were no longer allowing you to come in with a valve mask or the neck gaiters or bandanas. And I will say I, I'm a big neck gaiter person just because of the convenience of them. So do you recommend them or do you not recommend them? I haven't seen anything that says not to use them. So I, I would say doing something like that is better than wearing nothing. But the valve mask, as I mentioned before, the reason for that is it doesn't protect other people. It protects yourself, but your particles can still be released. I know when the governor first came out with the mandate, there were some people uh, saying that, hey, for health reasons, I, I, I can't wear a mask. And then you were seeing these online uh, it was basically like a card you could print off if you Google just, you know, medical mm -hmm. reason for not wearing a mask. And there was a little card you could print off to try to show businesses that you, you had a medical reason for not wearing a mask. Is there a medical reason for not wearing a mask? And if so, how do those people try to explain that to uh, the public and, and, you know, business owners? There are very few medical reasons for not wearing a mask. As I mentioned before, children under the age of two definitely should not be wearing a mask, but anyone two and above uh, technically has the ability. However, there, there may be uh, exceptions to this rule, people who have significant uh, breathing difficulties uh, such as COPD or uh, CHF, technically they, they can wear a mask, but if not tolerated, those people especially probably should not be leaving the home. Another uh, population are, are adults or children who have um, uh, mental disabilities or other uh, um, issues such as that. They may have a challenging time keeping the mask on or sensory processing disorders. But there are ways to also help kids and adults who have phobias uh, get used to the mask and, and wearing it at home for short periods of time and extending that time can help them adjust and get used to it. But when in doubt, it's always reasonable to discuss with your physician if, if this is an option for you, if you shouldn't be wearing a mask. But there are really very few exceptions to the rule. 
Family medicine physician Dr. Jennifer Burgess with us on the Oakland County MegaCast, joining us from Henry Ford Health System all across the Oakland County area. Uh, Dr. Burgess, there's been a lot of myths that have been put out there about wearing masks, the ways it can affect people's health. Oh, it actually makes you more susceptible to COVID-19. What are some of the more common myths that you have heard out in the ether over the course of the pandemic, and, and how can we go about debunking those myths? Yeah, you're exactly right. There are so many myths and how it can affect your health and uh, oxygen levels dropping or increasing the amount of carbon dioxide, CO2 that you inhale. The, the bottom line is science and data show that masks do not affect your oxygen level um, and will not increase your CO2 level. You're still able to expire those uh, those those chemicals essentially uh, to keep your oxygen levels up. And again, the bottom line is it won't increase your susceptibility to COVID-19. It's actually gonna prevent you from pot potentially being exposed or exposing others if you're a carrier that doesn't have symptoms yet. One of the things I see so much, people who have their mask on, they pull it down, it's under their nose. And even when you talk, a lot of times it will come down, but they wear it on their chin, they put it back up. How many people do you think are walking around and can, wearing a contaminated mask? And what advice do you have for us to make sure our mask is safe? And I think that's the challenging thing. If you are touching surfaces and then touching your mask, you're potentially exposing yourself. So uh, a big thing is once it's on, to keep it on, and prior to taking it off, make sure that you're washing your hands. And if this isn't possible, have an extra mask on hand that you can put on if you accidentally touch it or move it down. But you're right, if, if it's below your nose, you're still unfortunately going to expose others or expose yourself. Cloth masks should be washed at the end of the day. Just toss it in the washing machine. But the big thing, especially right now in general, wash your hands. So we're, we're talking with Dr. Jennifer Burgess. She's a family medicine physician at Henry Ford Health Systems. I live on the West Bloomfield Trail, and I see a lot of people that are wearing them as they're running. Should you wear a, ma a mask when you are exercising outside and if not, is it okay not to as well? So if you're exercising outside, that's a better option of social distancing in general. Plus you have the airflow going through. So it, it's definitely reasonable to run an exercise without a mask, but I would recommend having one on hand in case you are close to someone and unable to keep that six foot distance. But in general, it, it's pretty hard to exercise with a mask on and, and it's not recommended if at all possible. Right now we don't have the gyms open, so that's, that's kind of a non-issue. But if you're outside, uh, really it's reasonable to exercise without a mask. But if you're going to be passing someone just out of courtesy, I would put one on. Dr. Jennifer Burgess with us, a family medicine physician from Henry Ford Health System with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Burgess, a lot of people have issues with their masks not fitting correctly. They, you know, they get a certain mask that's just on hand, a blanket kind of general mask at work or at other places that maybe are a little bit loose or are too tight and they're not going to stay on when you're talking. What should people be doing to be able to adjust their masks if they are too tight or, or to find the mask that is the right fit for them? That has been the tricky thing, even buying masks for my own children, is, is you buy them and then you can't return them. So uh, I would definitely recommend if you're going to be purchasing a mask, buy one and try it out first. There are lots of options as far as helping with uh, ear uh, pain and discomfort, even if, if you go to Amazon or on Etsy, that that uh, you can wear something to kind of pull the the mask off from behind your ears. Uh, but once you find a mask that works well, I, I would buy a bunch of those so that they're on hand and, and can fit well. If they, if they tie, you can just adjust that way, but the ear loops can be a little bit trickier, but there are things that you can find to help modify that. 
I know. I uh, so I think it's this is more of a a chick thing, but I like to buy them so that they match. Like I found this cute little one. It has flowers. <laughs> it at the uh, gas station but it's like you said you don't know if they're going to work or they don't but one of the things i hate is because you mess them up women because of our makeup and our lipstick someone out there needs to design a mask that doesn't take off our makeup and doesn't take off our lipstick um but you know one of the other big issues is when you're wearing them and you're trying to read it your glasses fog up is there anything you can do to help prevent that Having a good fitting mask against your nose and against your cheeks will help with that as, as much as possible, just because if it's flat against your cheeks and your nose, that that air is not going to flow up. Otherwise, I think that that's the other, other one that would probably make a lot of money is a mask that would help prevent that uh, glass fogging. Okay, uh, so uh, I know I do know people that have been diagnosed with COVID, and some people feel like once they've already had COVID, they don't need to wear a mask anymore. For those people out there, what do you say? Should they still wear one? I mean, now you technically still have to, right, because of a state mandate, but for their own health, do they still need to wear a mask? The thing that is very frustrating about COVID-19 is there's a lot that we don't know. And there's a lot that we're figuring out day to day, minute by minute. So the problem is, even though somebody has had COVID-19, we don't know if they potentially could get it again. So just because there are antibodies or confirmed uh, disease and now completely asymptomatic, I definitely recommend continuing to wear a mask, at least until we have further science that shows that you will be safe. Dr. Jennifer Burgess with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is with Henry Ford Health System, a family medicine physician. In terms of kids wearing their masks, getting them ready to go back to school. Some are already back in school. You mentioned that children over the age of two should be wear, uh, are healthy to wear a mask. What suggestions do you have for parents about properly masking their children? What differences maybe are there between masking yourself and masking a younger child? So as we talked about with things changing constantly, the World Health Organization recently recommended five and above for for masks, so something to kind of keep an eye on. Right now, the recommendation is still two and above, but keep listening to, to the latest recommendations. But to help those younger children get used to wearing a mask, I recommend at home practicing and letting the child pick out the mask, put on the mask for short periods of time and gradually extend it. But also it will be very important in the schools to give mask breaks. So situations where the kids can be six feet apart and able to take the mask off and take a quick break and breathe. But the easiest way to prepare your child is this weekend heading into the school week is, is practice. Yeah, like the principal told us yesterday, Tyler, uh, the mask is the latest fashion accessory for these kids. So get out your bedazzle machine and oh make them unique. Uh, you know, doctor, I want I do want to say uh, like in Asia and China, they've run into this issue prior with other outbreaks. And so they're more accustomed and more accepting of wearing a mask than we are here in America. Do you think this is something that in the United States we're going to have to continue to utilize a mask post COVID? I'm, are we really going to have a completely post COVID? That, that's something that we definitely don't know yet. But as, as we're getting more vaccines that are in clinical trials right now, there's potentially hope once we we're able to vaccinate our population that we won't necessarily need to, to utilize the masks. But uh, we're still, you know, at least six to 12 months out from those trials being completed. So hopefully once we have that and there's more widespread use of, of the vaccine, we can talk about back in the day when we had to wear the masks. It's also going to be helpful during flu season. So it'll be interesting to see once we have the COVID vaccine, if this just becomes routine during blue cold COVID season in general. So time will tell. 
Time will tell on so many things. Dr. Jennifer Burgess with the Henry Ford Health System. Thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, Friday schedule to be with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. We appreciate your time and sharing your information and your wisdom and your knowledge with all of our listeners and viewers here on the Oakland County Megacast. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Happy weekend. Uh, Tyler and I are going to take a quick break and we come back. We are going to be talking all things IT because technology right now is helping us survive this pandemic. So a little bit of advice from some IT experts here on the Oakland County Megacast. We'll be back in just a few moments. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19 to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. You know, Tyler, I think one thing that we have all come to appreciate during the COVID-19 crisis, technology. Oh, yeah. Where would we be without technology? And I have to say, uh, a couple weeks ago, as m uh, most of you know, my husband uh, works for Fox 2, and the internet went out at home, and he had to do his sportscast from the house, a little hard when your technology goes out. And I think so many of us are experiencing IT difficulties during this time. So that's why we wanna go ahead and we are reaching out and talking to Brandon Hartke. He's the president of Expert Communications along with Carly Check. She's the, his uh, account manager. Thank you both for being on the Oakland County Megacast. You're heroes in this pandemic, I would imagine. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> nice to think that way. But. <laughs> Technology has really become so important during this time. Let's just start off with a little bit of advice that you can give to regular people. I know that you mainly service businesses, but even moms and dads if were at our houses, but we're also seeing businesses. We have the lady from the dance company in Kegel Harbor. She's going to be hosting like a learning pod. What advice do you give to all of us to be able to manage our internet uh, internet back at home to make sure we get the most out of it? Yeah, I think one of the keys is to, just like anything, really put an emphasis and be diligent about your IT and how you're using it. So the same thing that we've always had is how do we manage our kids using how much screen time, those types of things. It's important to do that and also secure your network and make sure that you're, you have a plan for how you wanna utilize that bandwidth. So if you're working or, and you're doing school and kids wanna play video games, make sure that you're kind of managing that. Maybe it's a schedule or that you're purchasing more, more connectivity and bandwidth. So Brandon, I understand. Are your kids work? Are are your kids remote at home? 
Yeah, so I have, uh, so so we're working from home primarily. Today we, we happen to be in the office, but primarily our whole our whole staff is is working from home. Um, so I'm working there. Uh, my wife is my wife is home, and I have uh, three kids that are at home, uh, 11, nine, and six that are all at home as well. So as school's kind of ramping ramping back up and going to be starting, they're all going to have that need for bandwidth. So how do you change the bandwidth? By the way, uh, if I had kids, I'd want you in my neighborhood because you'd be on my speed <laughs> dial. But if you do have kids and you have more, you know, two or three kids and you can't adjust the time that they all have to be on their devices yeah. because of this year they're going to start taking attendance at a lot of these uh, classes. What advice, like, do those little extra pod things that you see on the Xfinity commercials, do those help uh, with the Internet access in your home? So, so absolutely. Kind of the, there's there's two aspects and uh, of the of the internet. There's how much you have coming in. So how how much are you paying for from Comcast or Wow or Spectrum? How much are you paying for there, and what what can you get to to come in and make sure that you have that sized correctly? The other piece then is what are you doing kind of on your firewall? Sometimes that comes from that provider, that that cable provider, but there's things you can do to manage how much can be used per device and prioritize those. And then I, I definitely would recommend um, investing in maybe a little bit better Wi-Fi because that, that Wi-Fi connection that you do can manage those. So very simply, you can buy a, a Linksys device or something at, at Best Buy and actually prioritize maybe my computer for work over the Netflix or the Apple TV. So you can do those prioritizations really pretty easily. We have so many people working remotely right now. Talk a little bit about VPNs. What are they and why are they so important? Yeah, so, so VPN, it's a virtual private network. And the idea is that it's creating a secure tunnel back to something. And typically we hear that within our office environment, we're VPNing back to the office. So we're creating a virtual private network back to the office. When we do that, it's an encrypted tunnel. So in t instead of being out at uh, um, kind of, when you're at home, you can use that to get access to those files that would otherwise be inaccessible to you. So that's kind of how we use it for work. But when we also talk about public internet and public spaces, so, if, if maybe you didn't have good internet, so you have to go somewhere and again, in a pandemic, what do you do? You might not be sitting in McDonald's, but you might be sitting in your car outside of it. I mean, there's people that have Parking to lot. do those to, <laughs> to get access. And uh, a VPN of any sort can create a private connection and encrypt that, that traffic. So you're seeing a lot of products coming out that are just doing that on a public uh, per person type basis as well. So important, not only for your work, but just your personal information as well. You know, Carla, you and I have talked about this. You guys have a great backdrop there, but I think <laughs> people forget when they are doing Zoom calls or, uh, you know, remote business calls, whether it be over Google or Microsoft or Zoom, they're forgetting about what's in the backdrop of their phone calls. Why is that important? Well, Ronnie, um when you are displaying your your home office, you know, in, in the past, um, nobody was really able to peer into that office. So you'd have pictures of your children, you might have different degrees behind you that would show your full name. You might have your children's baby's pictures where it shows their full name, um, their birth date. All of those things are considered private information now and could be used to, to by the bad guys to, to hurt you. So you wanna make sure that you don't have anything personal, any type of personal information, especially if you're doing um, a medical call for any doctors out there, we've had a lot of consultations with them. Um, if they're doing a, a medical call with a patient, you wanna make sure that you don't even have uh, your, your manila files that have the patient's name on it. It's a HIPAA violation. And you have to be very, very conscious of that now. On the funny note, you have to also make sure that you have everything you need right in front of you. If you need your phone, if you need your, you know, your 
your pen, your paper, because if you are doing a Zoom meeting and you're not used to it and you stand up to go grab something, a lot of people are forgetting that they're not fully dressed for the office. <laughs> <laughs> So making sure that everything is um, ready for you and presentable, take a good look, take a couple of minutes, make sure your screen is positioned right, make sure your lighting is positioned right, um, make sure you're not washed out if you have a window by your um, in your office, and then making sure that if you are going to be on, on a very important meeting, your dog's not gonna bark in the background or, or your kids. So making sure that you can close that door and maybe even have a sign that you put out there that states that you're gonna be um, on a recorded line or, or speaking to somebody in a virtual meeting at that time. We're joined by Brandon Hartke and Carly Check from X for Communications with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And so for, for the longest time, internet has been considered an elective utility and more than ever right now during this pandemic we've been communicating whether it be for business whether it be for personal reasons between friends and family or for whatever the case may be over virtual means how much more now than ever have we seen evidence that the internet's not just a utility but an essential service in everyday life yeah i mean it's it's critical and, it, and it's very obvious that it, that it's critical for everything that we do um, so it, it is, there, there is no doubt that it's a, a critical utility. It's very important for it. And we see a lot of, you know, net neutrality and these, these other things, um, that, that have gone on. But, but the reality is that everyone needs to have it. Everyone needs access to it. And we really need access right. out into, you know, rural areas and areas where you can't get it. I mean, I think we've all experienced that as, as Michiganders and, that, that you go up north and you think you have coverage and then you find out you don't have enough bars and then that wherever you're, you're there's, there's no Wi-Fi available. And, and that really is an issue, especially in this type, type of environment. We see how big of an issue that is because it, it creates this, uh, you know, the haves and haves nots, if you will. And it's, it's yeah. more based on just area. So there is definitely a need for, for more uh, drive of those types of solutions. And you also see the home networks, Comcast, Spectrum, these types of things. Uh, the thing we have to pay attention to is there's an upload and a download. And now with videos and those types of things, we're actually doing more uploading than just downloading and streaming our videos. So that's an important area that has to, uh, has to increase as well to ensure that, that everyone's able to do all the work and the things they need to do at home. I would say during the pandemic, uh, the intranet was a necessity for uh, feeling connected to your loved ones, for being able to reach out and have those um, very important and private uh, conversations with your doctors, for grocery shopping. Uh, you know, it, it became even more in, important than than any other. Uh, need at the moment. It, it was, it was, it's your connection to the world at that point when none of us were supposed to be out and about. So talk, I know that your company mainly focuses on businesses. Can you share with us how during COVID-19 your businesses change during this and, and what do companies need now? Do they need your service more or less? Yeah, so it's, so it's interesting. Um, in a lot of cases, more. So I kind of take you through the the, the way that, that things happened with, within our organization is as people started working from home, there was there was a couple waves, right? Some companies started going earlier. Some companies waited till it was it was more mandated. Um, but as that happened, we saw huge spikes in the number of uh, ticket volumes and the number of people that we're working with because they're all moving to home. We had a lot of a lot of tickets, so we were doing two or three times as much work as we were doing, you know, prior to that. So everyone moved home and we were able to do that. Um, a lot of the companies we work with were already prepared in a lot of ways. They already had networks set up that had VPN access and it was just empowering the people with those tools and training them on how to use it. So, so it was really more of an education and getting them set up at home. And then we saw certain things weren't available laptops, mm -hmm. uh, different different things along those lines. So we kind of saw this, this wave that happened. And then 
um, it started to get back to normal, kind of kind of fell off a little bit, and then it happened again as businesses started opening up, and now we're running uh, kind of about normal. Everyone's it's it's kind of become we used to talk about the new normal. I feel like in a lot of ways the new normal is here mm -hmm. for how people are working within their organizations, um, but it, it's really been this kind of progression and wave and. The technologies, they need the technologies, they need us, but the technologies people are asking for and talking about have changed, right? We, we've gone from the worrying about a desk phone in the office to how do I have those desk features and functions on my mobile device? How do I have video calls with people? So the technology that we're talking about has changed a little bit, but, but everything's really kind of the, the same in that regard. Brandon Hartke and Carly check with us on the Oakland County Megacast. They are the president and account and an account manager at Axfer Communications with us on the program today. Just a few more minutes with the two of you before we let you go. Any other further tips or, or any other additional information that would be important for people to know regarding their IT at home, at the office, or connecting themselves properly to the internet? I would say having a plan in place. So we, we really had two different types of clients. Um, one that were fully vested in a managed service program with Exfer, and we had a true roadmap planned out for them for you know backup and disaster recovery. What happens if? Um, pandemic was never pandemic was never added to the list. It is now. Uh, but it was an easier transition for, for their workforce to go from brick and mortar to their at home office. And then we had clients that kind of did this, um, I don't wanna call it break fix, but I need this phone or I need this laptop or I need this printer. And it became very, very hard to A, find the equipment they needed and B, really truly facilitate all the end users of those of those organizations that did not want to or did not have a plan in place yet. My recommendation for anyone working from home or even in a hybrid um, uh, environment where you're going back and forth between your, your office and your home office, make sure you're having those conversations with the people you live with in your household the employees that you work with, your colleagues, or your IT department, or your IT company. If you don't have one, you can always call us for a consultation. But having a plan in place of what happens if my internet goes down? Where do I go? Who do I call? What if I need to stay in my house for another three, six, 12 months? What is that gonna look like with the type of technology I currently have in my office? and who is available on a 24-7, 365 to assist me um, should we have to you know, retreat back home again? Uh, so my recommendation is take a moment, pause, look around, see what you need, see what you um, can ask for, see if, you, if there's a, a, a bigger need for an additional resource like a company like X for to come in and assist. And um, really make sure that you are keeping a good detailed list of what happened and how, how things changed for you when the pandemic hit. So you know how to um, accommodate, answer, and, um, and expedite any of those issues um, again if we, if we should fall into another long-term pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope we don't do that. Brandon I Hartke know. and Charlie Tech with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Any uh, last words of advice or anything you want to get out there for people before we let you go? And also, uh, where are you guys located? We're like we're located in uh, Livonia, Michigan. We we serve pretty much anywhere in the country, but primarily Southeast Michigan. So so that's where we're uh, most of our customers are located. Yeah, Brandon, you can check out you... our website at www.exfer.com. We also have um, a social media presence through Facebook, um, LinkedIn. We even have a YouTube channel. Sometimes we put some really fun videos out there, um, how to, how not to. Um, and if you have any additional questions, you can, you can reach directly out to 
um, me, Carly Check, <laughs> at um, 734-259-6028. I think you guys need to get on TikTok. Hey, Brandon, real quickly before we let you go, you're working from home, your wife is working at home, and your kids are remote learning. Are you ready for this new school year, and are you going to survive? <laughs> and he has to deal with all of us. <laughs> you, you know what? It's been that way for I don't even know how many months now. So um, I actually really like it. I, I think it's been a, been a great thing from the standpoint of being able to spend more time with my children and, and my wife. So um so so that's definitely uh a, a, a really good thing and i think a positive that has come out come out of um everything that's happened yeah so you just got bonus points with your wife for saying that by the way well, today, <laughs> happens, today happens to be my anniversary so it's our 16th year anniversary so well happy anniversary <laughs> stop talking to us get out of the office and go take your wife uh, out to dinner thank you both so much for being with us here on the oakland county megacast and thanks for your advice and your insight as well thank thanks you so much us. guys happy weekend we uh, appreciate your time great advice there you know one thing that carly said that i didn't think about you know i'm all about the background oh yeah what's in the background oh, yeah. of your zoom calls but the one thing she mentioned I, I didn't think about was we see so many people with pictures of their kids mm -hmm. but i didn't think about their date of birth right you know they'll have the picture and their name that is the big thing so that is great advice take a few moments look what is behind you and you may think that people are seeing one thing and they're actually seeing another thing because one of the issues with that is with identity theft it's yes. such a huge issue oh, right yeah. now and so keep yourself safe keep your family safe because everyone is getting a peek into your house right now tyler yep exactly that's why i have cats that's right that's why <laughs> no one cares about uh, your cat's birthdays <laughs> hey uh we're gonna go ahead and uh, take a quick break here on the oakland county mega cast and when we come back we're going to be speaking with lisa brown she's the oakland county clerk and register of deeds boy this issue about the upcoming elections and your ballot making sure your voices count it's just not going away it's not being solved so it'll be good to get her insight on what we all need to do to go ahead and make sure that our ballot is counted in this upcoming election. You're listening to and watching the Oakland County Megacast. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks and our police and fire departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Thank you for joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith, and we join you Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon with newsmakers in and around Oakland County and the state of Michigan as we continue to navigate COVID-19 and its impact on our community. And we are seeing that ever so important our election coming up and one of the things that we've seen here in the state of Michigan is obviously uh, with the primary we are now allowed to vote with a mail-in ballot and that is causing a lot of issues and a lot of talk about does your ballot really count so we want to go ahead and let's bring in Lisa Brown she's the Oakland County Clerk and Registered of Deeds thank you for taking time out of your Friday to be on the Oakland County Megacast thank you for having me what an incredibly busy time 
for your staff. I mean, the primaries are over, but you probably don't even get to catch your breath before it's on to the November election. Well, for you, the primary is over, but we actually have recounts that we have to do. So we're really not done with August yet. And until we finish all that, we can't completely move on to November. So uh, it's yes, it's a busy time for us. We are hearing so much in the national news, of course, about the U.S. Postal Service. What is your take on everything that is going on and just the politics involved in this as well? Are you surprised or not surprised? Uh, I hate to say, I, I, you know what, I don't know if I can say I'm surprised or not, but I would say disappointed in the politics of it. Um, you know, we've had issues with, with ballots before, um, mailed ballots before with the post office. And, you know, this year there was a lot of coordination before COVID started uh, with like the, the um, design of the envelopes with the post office. I mean, the Secretary of State's office, the staff worked with the, with the post office staff to, you know, make sure everything was to the best that they would know, okay, this is a ballot, this is where it needs to go and all that sort of thing. And now to have this, um, I don't want to call it disruption. I don't even know what word to use for it, but um, it's, it's, it's unsettling. And I will tell you, I mean, from my office, we sent out a postcard um, with some election reminders from the August primary. And it took weeks for some people to, I mean, and it came after the election. It's not, it was very useful information, but it's not helpful if you get it after the election. So um, there's definitely a delay in some mail and I think when I was on the show before the primary, I talked about drop boxes and encouraging people to use those. And of course, I'm still singing that song to definitely um, use a drop box. So Clerk Brown, with the issues that's continuing to amount with the post office and their delays, what is your office and other local clerks, either at your suggestion or, or on their own fruition, doing in that case to ensure that these applications and these ballots and then eventually uh, the votes are getting out to the public and coming back in a timely manner. Right. So again, I, I guess first make sure you're registered to vote, right? And um, if you have a, if you're not and you have a driver's license or a state ID, you can do that online. Um, but um, you know, if you haven't already requested an absentee ballot for November and that's how you want to cast your ballot, then you know, make sure you get that um, request into your city or township clerk. And, uh, but again, like I just had my mom ask me, where's my ballot? Well, we haven't even gone to print yet. So <laughs> be patient. Um, you'll probably get them uh, towards the end of September. Um, but then once you do get your ballot, um, re don't wait on returning it. Um, if you have changed your mind in, in the first week of October or whenever, you can always spoil your ballot. But the sooner you get it back, at least you'll know um, that it's been returned and you can track your ballot uh, but the FST ballot tracker that is on the Secretary of State's website. So, you know, be an active voter and and um, taking control and at least, uh, you know, knowing where you are in the process and ensuring that your ballot has been returned on time. Because we are not a postmark state. Um, it has to be returned to your city or township clerk by 8 p.m. On election, on election day. It doesn't matter if it was postmarked a week before the election and it comes a week after, it doesn't count. So we wanna make sure every ballot counts, every vote counts. So again, that's why I'm encouraging the drop boxes as well. Yeah, I think there is some confusion too. I know that we got uh, in the mail, I believe it's the application for the absentee or the, the mail-in vote. Why send those out and not just have people that do want them reach out to their clerk's office for them? Well, the Secretary of State um, sent everyone an application um, for the primary. And, uh, you know, as you talk about voting by mail, yes, this is, I think a lot of people are interested in it because of the pandemic. But also, this is, you know, this is our first year with big elections since the passage of Proposal 18.3 that allows anyone, um, doesn't matter what reason, to vote by mail. So we were expecting, before even COVID started, we were expecting to see an increase in absentee voting because everybody had the right to, to vote that way. So, um, but the secretary, I think, did that just to make it an easier process. Um, you know, that, that was something she chose to do. And, um, you know, we're, we're definitely encouraging people to vote by mail. We want people to be safe, but again, make sure you get that ballot in on time. 
Michigan is kind of late to the game compared to some of the other states for this mail-in uh, voting. So what have you learned from other states? And do you think you need more staff to be able to process so many of these mail-in uh, ballots? Well, you know, in August, we just um, tabulated ballots for 16 municipalities in Oakland County for the first time. There was new legislation that passed in June that allows uh, city and township clerks to either contract with one another or to contract with the county clerk. And I signed contracts with 16 uh, cities and townships and we tabulated over 50,000 ballots. Um, and we were done before dinner. Um, we could have done more, um, but we hired a lot of people to do that. And, you know, we really did the math. Um, we had my staff um, really go through the process and open up envelopes, the whole thing that an absentee voting county board does um, from beginning to end and see how many could be done in an hour. And if, you know, you, this many people can do this in an hour, if we're doing this many ballots, how many people do we have to hire? So we, we really did the math to try and figure that out. And, uh, you know, we're looking at November as well. But, you know, I encourage people to, if they feel comfortable to, um, to contact their local clerk or to contact my office if they're interested either in working in the polls or in the absentee county board. Just how much of an increased need for election workers is there for this upcoming election across the board? Well, I think that's going to differ from um, from municipality to municipality. Um, you know, I don't think that number changes for what you have in the precincts. That's that's a stable number. But um, I think for the absentee county board, you know, there there's more staff needed there. Again, we did the math to figure out what that number would actually be. Um, every you know, it's usually done by the by the city or township clerks, the processing mm -hmm. of the absentee ballot. So it's up to each individual one as to how they process their ballots, how many people they hire. But um, I think that um, no one would feel like uh, they have too many. And um, especially because, you know, the day before or sometimes on election day, you have people who are sick or suddenly don't feel comfortable or just don't show up. So it's nice to have backup as well. Lisa Brown with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, what did you learn from the August primary that will help you in November? Well, for us, again, because it was the first time we tabulated um, absentee ballots, um, it was, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I was very nervous. It was taking on a responsibility that um, I've never had before. It's not legally my responsibility. It's with the locals, but um, partnering with our locals because this, you know, how our elections are run in Michigan really is a team effort from the city and township clerks to the county clerk to the Bureau of Elections at the Secretary of State's office. And um, whatever we can do to support each other, make our elections more efficient. Um, I think also, you know, people want results in a timely fashion. So, you know, at 801, we had 16 municipalities uh, absentee ballot results on our website. And um, I think that was a good process for us. Um, of course, there's things to learn and improve. And I think, you know, our local clerks would probably say that as well. Um, the thing for the clerks that we did contract with, any absentee ballots that came in after 4 p.m. on Monday before the election, they had to process those in the precinct. And that was a lot of work for them. So um, some of them just were inundated with ballots that came in on election day. And so again, I would, I would kindly request that people return their ballots sooner. Um, it's a lot of work to process an absentee ballot. And it's not just that the envelope comes and they rip it open and put it through a tabulator. I mean, the, the signature is checked and it's checked in, it's put into the computer. I mean, there's there's a lot of steps that go into place. So, um, you know, to alleviate all that extra stress on election day, it would be nice if people return their ballots earlier. And I know for, like I said, the local clerks that we contracted with, they're going to change um, some of their processes um, to accommodate that bulk that may come in on election day. I know your office is tasked with so many other responsibilities. Do you want to talk about the other services you provide? And I would imagine, is your office open right now or is it by appointment only? How is that working? We are by appointment only. We've been by appointment only for months. I, I You know what? I don't even know what date it is anymore, but uh, I do. I'm kidding. But um, uh, we are by appointment. Um, and um, I just recently actually opened a satellite office um, in the south 
Oakland office building, which is in Troy. So it's another location that people can access our services. Um, you know, with the setup here in Pontiac, um, I can't have all of my staff here in person because they wouldn't be socially distanced. They're just, their desks are too close together. So we have a lot of people working from home, but opening the satellite office allows another place for people to get appointments. So um, I'm really proud of that. That was something I've been working on for a really long time. Uh, but the other services, uh, well, I'm the Register of Deeds. And if people haven't heard of my program, uh, Property Records Notification, PRN, it's my baby. I'm very proud of it. It's the first of its kind in the country program. Um, to alert homeowners to recordings on their properties. Um, it's for free and um, it, you know, I've just seen so much fraud in the Register of Deeds office and I'm, my staff and I are really limited in what we can do. Um, we're not allowed to investigate a document when it's presented for recording. So, um, but I have seen forged signatures on deeds and bogus liens on property and you know, you wouldn't know that somebody did that to your home. So if you sign up for this program, you'd get an email. It's basically like a Google alert, but on our property records. So uh, that website to go to, and you can also search our, our property records for free as well. O-C-M-I-Deeds, D-E-E-D-S dot com. Um, and you scroll down and you'll see property records notification and you can sign up for that. Um, so I'm also the clerk of the circuit court. So all of our circuit court records, um, I like to say I do everything from birth to death and everything in between. So you're, if you were born in Oakland County, your birth record is here, um, marriage licenses, uh, concealed pistol licenses, DBAs. Um, I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot that goes on here. And of course I clerk for the board of commissioners meetings, the jury commission, um, I'm going to forget a couple because <laughs> there's so many things. Uh, the majority caucus for the Board of Commissioners, uh, the Election Commission, and I'm forgetting one off the top of my head. But anyways, yes, there's a lot that goes on at the Clerk Register of Deeds Office. You know, in other counties, they're two elected, two separately elected offices, the Clerk and the Register of Deeds. They're both constitutional offices. They're in our Constitution. Um, but I think in 1952, the Oakland County Board of Commissioners voted to combine those offices. So, so it's, it's a lot all in one. I was going to say, so we need like 20 of you. You want to multiply yourself so many oh, times. I, I, like, I like being busy. I like being busy. It's all good. So are you seeing much of a delay in your office for some of these services? No, my staff has been incredible. I have such a great team here. Um, uh, you know, when we were, we were kind of, I don't want to say closed, but I guess I'll say closed. We were still working. Um, and we still encourage, even though we've got appointments, we're still encouraging people to, um, you know, conduct business with us online if you can, um, or by mail, but there are certain things that you have to come in person for. Uh, but, um, concealed pistol license being a big one that you have to be in person for, for a new concealed pistol license. If you're renewing, you do that online. Uh, but, you know, coming here and applying is one step of the process. The next step is getting fingerprinted. Um, and most people who do that then would go across the street to the sheriff's office and get fingerprinted there. And so they weren't fingerprinting for a while. So I think we have a little bit of a, I don't want to say a backlog, but I guess I could say a backlog. Not in our, not on our side so much, but I know that they're booked out um, pretty far for their appointments to get fingerprinted. Clerk Brown, just another couple of minutes with you. Clerk Lisa Brown with us, the Oakland County Red Clerk and Register of Deeds on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, before we let you go, anything else that you'd like to speak to your constituents about or uh, any other additional information we haven't touched on today? Uh, I just uh, reminding people again, when they do, um, if they are voting by uh, at home or even in person, because um, you can bring your own pen to the precinct, just make sure it's a blue or black ink pen and make sure you fill in that box next to your choice. Um, check both sides of the ballot. Uh, and um, like I said, if you are voting um, absentee, um, you know, see if your municipality has a drop box, a ballot drop box that you can drop it off. Um, that way you don't have to worry um, about the timing of it with the post office and you know that it's already in your clerk's hands. So I have a suggestion. I know that you don't uh, make this decision, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it with everyone that I can is on the ballot drop boxes. It needs to be some type of system. So when I put the ballot in, it spits out an I voted sticker. <laughs> 
I like that idea. You know, and um, I know I miss getting a sticker uh, in August myself, and especially because uh, the Board of Commissioners had a sticker contest um, to celebrate the anniversary, the centennial of, of the suffragettes, of the women's right to vote. And um, we had two winning sticker designs. I was uh, honored to be one of the judges. It was not easy. We have so many talented students in um, Oakland County, but they were just great designs that were, we were, you know, were made to be used this year. And um, not everybody got those because so many people were voting by mail. See, so I'm on to something. <laughs> I, I, I like it. I like it. I want my sticker. Lisa Brown, I, Oakland County Clerk, Register of Deeds here in Oakland County. Thanks so much for uh, joining us on the uh, Megacast and, and taking time out of your busy schedule because it seems like you need like 20 of you. I don't know how you make it through the day. So thank you so much. We do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Just about 30 seconds here as we wrap up on the mega cast. Uh, we want to say thank you to all of our guests here that uh, took time out all week long. I will say, Tyler, we've had some amazing guests this yes. week. A lot of information that we have been sharing with people. So as a reminder, you can check that out on civiccentertv.com. Thank you to Larry, our Zoom producer, to Jake for all of your hard work. I'm Ronnie Dahl alongside Tyler Keith. Tyler, you're the man. Oh, Happy thanks. weekend, everyone. Thanks. You're watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast.